Welcome to our first panel session after the excellent speeches we heard earlier. Uh, my name is Danielle Cave and I'm Head of ASPE's Strategy, Research and Executive. I actually live in Tokyo now and I work remotely uh, and I can get away with jeans and tracksuit pants and then a suit jacket which I throw on for meetings and it's been a very long time <laughs> since I've been at an event like this so I have to say this is an enormous step up for me in presentation. And I'm taking this big step mostly because I like ORF so much quite frankly and especially Samir and his team. Uh, they're a delight to work with, very, very creative and strategic, uh, more so probably than any other think tank I can think of uh, around the world, and I've certainly met a lot of think tanks, which I think makes ORF a really fantastic asset for both India and the Indo-Pacific more broadly, and very few countries have such an influential think tank. Our session today will examine the strengthening partnerships in a time of geopolitical and techno technological competition. It's a great topic, it's a broad topic, uh, geopolitics will almost certainly come out in every question, but I will try to steer us to discussions about India's growth into becoming a digital and tech and science powerhouse. Uh, and that really has been the theme of so many of our ministerial speeches today. We had two this morning at the business brunch and the two we've witnessed this afternoon. And before I introduce our three esteemed panellists here, uh, let me say that this technology discussion is very important for us at ASPE. Uh, I see ASPE as a leading Indo-Pacific think tank, not just on defence and national security now, but also on technology. And this technology piece will only become more important for us across this year, especially because of the Sydney Dialogue in April 4th and 5th. Uh, and second, in a fortnight, we're launching a very large technology project, actually at a small event at, at the Racina Dialogue in New Delhi, uh, which is a website tracking countries, universities and companies across 44 technologies. And I wanted to raise it because it will show that India performs incredibly well, uh, even better than we thought, especially in the fields of advanced materials and manufacturing, AI, computing, communications, energy and environmental techs, we've already heard a lot about today, critical minerals and also well in the defence and space categories of advanced aircraft engineers, hypersonics and drones. So a lot of interesting data there. One key institute that shines through this global data set is the Indian Institutes of Technology, uh, and it's a key organisation uh, producing a lot of India's most high quality and high impact science and technology research, and you see them across the website, it's quite fascinating. But I wanted to point out this performance because unlike other large countries, it's very unique, very different to China's and the United States, both performance and trajectory. India's external affairs minister talked at the business brunch this morning about India's efforts to retain more of its digital science and technology talent uh, and of the hope that Australian universities will, cons will consider opening campuses in India. And our upcoming research will show that India contributes huge portions of its domestic talent across all sectors, including to Australia, to Europe and especially to the United States. But despite this global brain drain, India still performs in a top three or four country and is clearly on an upwards trajectory. And this perfectly, I think, ties back into our panel discussion we're about to kick off, because the Indo-Pacific is quite easily the world's centre of technological innovation and strategic competition. And it's worth us all thinking about these global strategic shifts that are already in play now, how that balance of skills, of talent, of R&D technology and changes in supply chains uh, will impact us over the coming years, particularly as China too ramps up enormously uh, in this space. Um, so with that, let me get to the reason we're here, our panellists. Uh, Ashok Malik, who has just spent a week with us at ASPE, is immediately to my right here in Canberra. He's now an ASPE non-resident senior fellow, full-time as a partner in India chair at the Asia Group, a strategic advisory firm in Washington, DC, with over 30 years of experience working across Indian government media and think tanks, uh, previously as a policy advisor, additional secretary in India's Ministry of External Affairs. Uh, Dr. Michael Green, uh, over there on the side, is Chief Executive Officer of the United States Centre at the University of Sydney, so a talent gain for us in Australia. Dr. Green was uh, previously a Senior Vice President for Asia, Japan Chair, and Henry A. Kissinger Chair at the Centre for Strategic and International Studies, and before that uh, was on the National Security Council from 2001 to 5, where you covered a range of countries and themes with a focus on Asia. Uh, and in the middle here is my colleague, Beck Shrimpton, ASPE Director responsible for convening the Sydney Dialogue, Premier po Policy Summit for Critical Emerging Cyber and Space Technologies. She has the, big the busiest job in ASPE. Uh, it's quite incredible. And over 20 years experience in policy and operational roles, primarily in the Department of Defence and also DFAT. How I'm gonna run this panel, because it's quite tight for time, is I have a couple questions uh, each for you, and then we'll go to the floor, hopefully for another few questions. 
I'm going to put out two questions to you at the same time. Uh, you can answer both or one. It's totally up to you. Play to your strengths uh, and passions. And I will give you prompts so that you don't have to remember them word for word. And a shock, because you've travelled the furthest, uh, you can go first. Uh, so number one question is, over the last decade in particular, Australia and India have shown that cooperation is possible beyond cultural ties and cricket, with a growing strategic convergence across sectors that have been historically quite complex at times, economics and trade, security, defence and increasingly technology. So the question is, what is the limit for our cooperation? For example, is a security treaty hard to envision? Uh, where could we go in areas like technology and space? So that's one that's, that's, that's out there for you. Number two is how do we leverage a closer partnership to drive influence in the Indo-Pacific? For example, with a more ambitious agenda in the Quad or by pursuing shared interest in larger multilateral settings or in Southeast Asia in the Pacific? So first question, limits for cooperation. Second question, on partnership leveraging, how to do that better and where? Okay. Over to you, Ashok. Thank you, thank you very much. And thank you, Aspi and ORF for inviting me here. Uh, you haven't asked uh, two questions, you've asked me for a PhD thesis, which I obviously <laughs> can, <laughs> cannot sum up. I think the limits to, to the partnership are in our imagination, quite frankly. Uh, but if I were to, to, to make that more granular, I think the areas we'd like, we should focus on is very broadly security in the broader sense of the term. Because security today is not just about gunboats and ships, uh, uh, which is also there, of course. Traditional security certainly matters. But in our part of the world, which is so consequential to the global economy, to our shared prosperity, uh, climate change, uh, supply chains, technology, uh, the, os the osmosis between traditional and non-traditional security, preparing for the next pandemic and preparing for the next biological attack, uh, overlap tremendously. In all of these areas, we have to recognize, and we are recognizing, that something, a frisson that is, begins in the Indian part of the Indo-Pacific is going to be felt in the Pacific part of the Indo-Pacific. What starts near Sydney ends up near Chennai, and vice versa. Uh, as Minister Jayashankar said, this entails both Australia and India pooling our strengths uh, and working to help each other in our sub-regions. So what happens in the Pacific Island is consequential to me in India. And what happens in the Indian Ocean in Sri Lanka or Myanmar is consequential to you in Australia. Uh, quite frankly, it's that imagination that, that has to be reinforced and re-emphasized time after time, year after year, through multiple transitions in government here and there which is really what this issue was about. Thank you, Ashok. Mike, I might skip to you. Sorry, Beck, we'll come back next. to you to go next. Um, thank you. Thanks, Justin, for inviting me. Congratulations to ASPI and ORF on this inaugural dialogue. Everything that you said about ORF is true. They have a pretty strong presence in Washington. Now ASPI does. People are really worried about this India-Australia pinch uh, <laughs> that's coming, but it would be a good thing. Um, so. Uh, my sense is that the uh, India-Australia relationship, like the Quad, is on a steady upward trajectory that will continue um, uh, for at least a decade. Um, and um, I say that because I think the most important variable, there's a very rich agenda that both ministers talked about for cooperation, necessary cooperation. But the most important variable that determines how closely Australia or the US or Japan work with India is frankly, um, a, a country that starts with C to the north of us, and I'm American and I'm not talking about Canada, um, <laughs> that, that neither minister mentioned once. It always amazes me. In Washington, you go to something like this, and if you counted how many times China was said, you'd get to 50 or 100 times. It was really quite fascinating to me, still is six months later, how little China is mentioned explicitly, but that's the driver. And as I've, I was in the White House on, on Boxing Day, um, uh, 2004, when the Indian Ocean tsunami happened and we stood up the quad very quickly, in part because it was Christmas break and most of the US government was gone, which was wonderful, <laughs> um, uh, but also because there was a foundational understanding that of course US, Japan, Australia as treaty allies, but India also had a fundamental role in providing public goods for this region and unstated that the US, Australia and Japan had a fundamental interest in India being a geopolitical player. Um, uh, but it's hard. Um, at that time, I also sat across from then additional Secretary Jai Shankar for the negotiations on our nuclear agreement, which was really hard. The uranium issue is going to be hard. 
<laughs> and governments do these hard things, not just because there are opportunities, but because they're scared, <laughs> because there's an urgency. And I think a lot of that comes from what we've seen uh, with China. And at various points in the history of Australia, India relations, and the Quad, um, there were governments in Australia and the US, sometimes in Japan, that assumed the future of this region depended on a bipolar condominium or arrangement with China. That was quite popular in 2009-10 and in, in, in the US and Australia. And um, the Quad failed. Now our surveys at uh, the US Studies Center, surveys at CSIS, show pretty clearly that Americans and Australians and Japanese think that to deal with China, cooperate, work together, but to deal with the China we see today, highest priority is working with allies and partners. So we're now in a world where Xi Jinping's not gonna change course, maybe tone, maybe tactics. And so I think Australia is going to be motivated to do some of the hard things necessary to, um, to give India capacity. Because ultimately the alignment is important, but what really is important for stability in this region is that India continues to be a net exporter of security and welfare. Um, and that's not just about alignment, it's also about capacity, and, and which is why we did the nuclear deal, why I think the uranium export thing's important, why the US agreement recently with India on technology development is important. I think that's the game. It's, it, that's what really motivates us to do some of the hard things, because India, um, sorry Ashok, but you know well you were in MEA. India, be, India can be hard. <laughs> Um, Beck, let's come to you. So either limits for cooperation, partnership leveraging, how do we do that better and where? And if we can spark your infectious passion for topics like space technology and deterrence, that would make me very happy. Not difficult to spark those <laughs> at all, I have to say. Uh, look, I think two really interesting and complimentary answers from the from the previous two speakers. So, um, you know, I, I agree with, with both here. There are real external factors that are that are driving this partnership as well as internal uh, factors in both countries. And that's really important to understand the push factors, the pull factors, you know, it, it's, it's complex, but, um, but it is a range of things that are happening here. Um, I love the word imagination and I don't think we use it enough. And, and I do think it's a challenge. I really do. Um, you know, policy making, what makes a good partnership? What, what, what makes for the kind of partnership that, that increases security, stability? Um, you know, it, it is words like trust, agility, and I think most importantly, understanding and awareness. So um, look, there's absolutely no doubt that the common ground between our countries is expanding, that our external outlooks are increasingly aligned. Um, so this really does set a path for, um, you know, a, a great growth in the relationship. Nobody wants to use the term no limits partnerships right now. Um, so I certainly won't, but I do think that the caps are really probably going to be self-imposed if, if they are to the extent that they exist. Thank you for the question on space, because I think this domain, like almost no other, um, really can help illustrate the potential of this relationship. It talks to deep complementarities in uh, research and development capability, in that industrial capability, in the challenge that came from the question, thank you so much for it, it was great, I thought, about Australia's lack of ability to scale. It's not that we don't have brilliant innovators and it's not that we can't produce the very best bleeding edge capability, but we often cannot scale. Um, so how do we bring these things together? Well, you know, space as a domain, um, you know, great opportunity for collaboration, but it also offers so many opportunities to solve big problems here on Earth. Climate, um, ocean monitoring, Earth observation, communications. Um, we just do not, I don't think our publics are yet aware enough of just how much our everyday lives rely on space. So I think it's one that makes sense at the social level, at the individual level, at the economic level, at the strategic level, and most definitely makes sense uh, at a national security level. Fantastic. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask another thesis style question uh, to the panel, and then because we're so tight on time, I might actually go straight to the floor for a couple questions. So if you wanna have a, if you wanna put out a question, please think of them now. Uh, Mike, let's start with you as our token American, as we bring in the US. Uh, the Indo-Pacific faces an inherent contradiction involving many countries in the region who often don't want bipolar US-China competition. I, I just wanna make, make a note that I've mentioned China a, a few times now. Um, but who also largely want a uh, continued strong US engagement in the region. 
How can countries like Australia and India work together with other key partners and allies like US and Japan and others to help ensure regional prosperity and security, but I think also help to provide and stimulate greater confidence and trust in that regional prosperity uh, and security? Well, if you think about it, um, Australia and India together have the largest population in the world. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the opportunities are limitless. No. Um, so, um, you know, one of the most fundamental transformations in American strategic thinking over the last five years has been a recognition of something many of us were advocating, that this is a multipolar region. Um, and as um, Dr. Jaishankar said, I think quite accurately, that relative US power is insufficient to maintain a stable equilibrium. And so we need allies and partners. Our surveys show that Americans who always support alliance with Australia and Japan um, now support it for a different reason, which is they think we need Australia and Japan for our security. And there is a greater willingness um, to, to, to do things like AUKUS or the technology agreement with India, despite our bureaucratic obstacles, which are well known. Um, so the middle power cooperation, I think, is fundamentally in U.S. interests. And um, the more India and Australia, Australia, Japan, India, Japan develop relations, the better it is for the U.S. in terms of maintaining uh, a, a, an equilibrium and getting away from Beijing's preferred narrative that it is a bipolar region. You know, the great new model of great power relations, that the Xinjiang, Dago, Guanxi, where the U.S. and China will settle things and the smaller powers will live with it. That's not in our interests. So uh, this um, really um, dynamic relationship between India and Australia is important. So is the Quad. Um, what, could, what could countries do together? Um, very quickly, I think um, uh, Dr. Jashankar sort of, sort of brushed on this, but I think the, the Quad countries in particular could do a much better job um, monitoring foreign interference and resilience across this region. Um, I think we could do more on climate mitigation um, the Indo-Pacific Command has a fantastic model you can get on their website where they predict the impacts of climate change in places like Bangladesh and Myanmar. They have to because they're deploying every year and they've now made it publicly available. So, you know, jointly, India, Australia, the Quad could be looking at working for strategies for climate mitigation, adaption, consequence management. Um, I think we are um, entering an era where a standing joint task force for the Quad is, is a realistic proposition, maybe headquartered in Yokosuka, but with a rotating um, uh, headquarters at sea between the Canberra or the Blue Ridge or an Indian um, carrier. So there's a lot we could do. I, I just said, and um, the New York University did this fascinating study last year. It was on CNBC. They did a documentary, you can find it, where they interviewed about 100 people who worked on the Quad from all four countries. Then out of that, they created this complicated quantitative model to predict what would happen to the quad. And it was growth, including all the things I've just mentioned. Um, so lots of potential. Fascinating. Do either of you want to come in on that question or else I might ask both of you a different one? Any strong thoughts you want to bite into there? You know, I, I just want to add something about the quad. Uh, I think one of the quad's big strengths is that the quad is loosely defined and ambiguous. And this ambiguity, uh, uh, frankly, sometimes confounds quad member countries and their citizens. It also confounds uh, those on the other side, which is, which is a strength, actually. Uh, quad was always meant to be agile and nimble, not a building with lots of civil servants going in from nine to five. Uh, quad is not always about all four countries coming together and all four bureaucracies somehow miraculously working together, because that can be complicated. Quad is about principles. Quad is about evangelizing quad principles, whether alone, singly, or bilaterally. It's about India and Australia working with Indonesia. It's about India and Australia working in the Pacific Islands. It's about India and Australia working in, let's say, Sri Lanka. Not necessarily, but all four countries having to work together. So uh, I think the, the big strength of Quad that it, is that it can, if you adhere to its, its principles, in a sense, and its values, which is, which is transparency, which is uh, uh, market determined principles for projects and so on, it can be defined in just about any way. Mm. And it may long remain that because, uh, as you said, countries in the region don't really want to choose. Uh, this is really a battle for the hearts and minds of those smaller countries which are being forced to make a choice and don't want to make a choice. And Quad and, as I said, Quad countries need to go there with a positivist agenda. This is what we have. This is what we offer. Not this is what we are not. Yeah. And it does feel like the COVID-19 pandemic 
supercharge that sort of external facing role for the quad. Beck, I'm going to throw you a very different question, uh, actually, um, and just a bit of a side step in topics, and then we'll go to the floor. Um, I want to know from you how you think the Russian invasion of Ukraine has impacted the region as it reevaluates its strategic vulnerabilities. Yeah, that's, um, it's, a, it's a really good question. It's a timely question and it's an important question. Um, look, I think it, it, for many of us, uh, underlined what we, we knew in our guts and, and a lot of the rhetoric, the policy rhetoric, um, paid heed to. This is, we live in a truly globalised world. Conflict can happen anywhere in the world and when and if it does, it has absolutely global implications. So you cannot, you cannot contain conflict. Um, you know, the world is interconnected and, and there's no peeling that back um, easily. I think what Ukraine really brought into sharp relief was um, the unthinkable can and does happen. So that 1% sort of, you know, probability but catastrophic consequence event that, you know, we, we like to sort of look at and think about it as a risk but put in that, put in that nice little corner and not actually treat um, we need to start treating it. Um, and I think that's, that's really brought um, to the front of the consciousness of many of the countries in this region, you know, the nature of the various actors, uh, you know, and how, how they exercise power, um, you know, what is the difference between actors? And I think what is, what is interesting to think about from a, from a regional country's perspective is um, when you look at this region, um, do we see a Russia? Um, certainly not in India, I wouldn't have thought. Um, certainly not in Japan. Certainly, I hope not, in Australia. Um, but yeah, we, we see something that looks a little bit like, um, you know, a Russia in, in Europe, and that's deeply, deeply frightening. So, I mean, what's the right response to that? Um, it, it is collaboration. It's not panic, but it is increased urgency in thinking about all of the, you know, the things that have been revealed um, as dependencies and, you know, it does cause us to rethink uh, the way that we have, the way that we have meshed and the way that we have created dependence. Um, that said, I think the other really interesting thing, and to bring it back to technology a little bit, um, I think that we were starting to think that technology was going to make war kind of clean and a little bit less messy and, and a little bit less catastrophic. And if, if Ukraine has shown us several things, it's one, technology really, really does matter. The private sector really does matter and they're going to be in there on the ground sometimes before nation states are, but they're not going to make war cleaner. The fundamentals of war still exist and they come back to humans and they come back to bloodshed and attrition and things like industrial capability, stockpiling and all these sorts of things that we haven't thought about for a very long time. So that is driving entirely different conversations in this region than were happening two to three years ago. I think that's a good thing, but I think, again, um, we need to be measured and deliberate and calm um, and go back to these principles of what is a good partnership, um, what is a good relationship, whether it's strategic, economic, industrial, technological. All right, let's go to the floor. Um, I'm going to ask, I'm going to take maybe three questions uh, from this at the same time. If people are being shy, I have an additional question I'd love to throw to our panellists. Do we have any hands up for questions from the floor? Uh, Ian Hall. Hi, so Ian Hall from Griffith Asia Institute in Brisbane. So questions to the, to the whole panel, but maybe specifically to Mike Green. Uh, look, for understandable reasons, the US government and US firms are concern, concerned about their intellectual property. But if we're going to manage all the challenges in this region, we're going to have to share some of that intellectual property. So what work still needs to be done, particularly in Congress, to loosen some of the controls that exist uh, in order that we can all collectively uh, deal with some of the challenges in the region? Thank you. Do we have any more from the floor? Yep. OK, might take, I might take all of them and then we'll call it a close. Thanks, Danielle. Uh, Petty Yates from the Asia Foundation. As someone who spends a fair bit of time on development cooperation, I've been surprised how often it's actually come up um, today. Um, and the new government has obviously got new de development policy, but also the defence capability review going on. I'd be interested across the different arms of sort of statecraft. Where do you think the new government needs to prioritise and sort of supercharge things when it comes to the relationship with India? Um, hi, I'm Amit Mehta and uh, I represent the 
uh, Australian Corporate Treasury Association in Queensland, where I'm the chair of that. So I come from a corporate background. It's about risk. And uh, actually, just a few days ago, I watched a video uh, with Samir in it uh, and with my business school professor from IMD. And they said the risks identified in 2019 at Davos are the same as they were done in 2023. Now, when you are a corporate and you're trying to plan and you're making investments, which is necessary for economic growth, how do we advise chief executives on corporates to make investments and to start feeling more secure about this extremely volatile world where we don't know what's going to happen next? Fantastic. And Gisela, we might come down, or Barn, whoever's closest, to Michaela down here as well for a fourth and final question. Hello, my question's on cybersecurity. Um, some of the most sophisticated, the most complicated threat actors that we face are state backs threat actors. Um, so can I ask you to reflect on how do we need to involve our, our governance, our policies and our capabilities in that context? Does that require a radical rethink? And what do we think, especially if we're thinking about emerging tech, about the quantum race and what that will mean in that sector? Okay, that's a very, um, very diverse range of questions. Mike, let's go to you first, because you also got a specific one on IP. So the IP question is pretty fundamentally, and I, I'm glad you raised it. I, I don't think the problems in the US private sector, um, you know, a company like Google or Microsoft or Boeing sees a global marketplace and global innovation. They're all being forced um, to de-risk from China. But even, you know, traditional sort of national security um, companies like Lockheed Martin are building things like the F-16 and the F-35 globally, with global partners. The problems in the, in the US government and the Congress, and um, the, you, you know, there's a survey show that um, the American people and the Australian people um, want less reliance on China, trust Japanese, American, Australian uh, technology. Um, our survey shows that Americans and Australians would be willing to pay about $400 more for an iPhone if they were told it was not made in China, which is kind of an interesting test. Now, when they go to the store, I, I'm not sure that would still be true, but at least in theory. Um, so the, the public sort of gets it. The, the problem, we have two problems in terms of US government policy. One is that the export control regime that covers thing, things like the much loved ITAR, <laughs> that covers tech transfer to Australia, um, was, was built for the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. Um, and there are parts of the US government, particularly the State Department, that only get rewarded for not making mistakes, not for actually building allied capabilities. And um, they're fighting a valiant rearguard action, and I think they're going to get rolled eventually. Um, not fast enough to satisfy defense and defat, but that's the trend. The other problem, though, is um, because, frankly, of the China challenge, um, now even Republicans, you know, Reagan Republicans are talking about industrial policy. And there's no discipline in the Congress on rent seeking. And so you have a White House strategy a year ago that says we're going to collaborate with allies on technology competition and development. And then two paragraphs later, we're going to emphasize Buy American. Mm -hmm. And the IRA is an example. So this is, an, is, as our Chinese friends like to say, this is a, an inherent contradiction <laughs> and um, will have to be resolved. And I'm going to be as obnoxious as possible. Um, to try to get there. I think um, uh, Dr. Jay Shanker's observation about the American Congress and public and government knowing we need allies is going to drive this in the right direction. And I hope Australia is obnoxious too. Um, on cyber, um, it's, it's, you know, it, it, there's a lot that can be said about cyber. To me, the part that's most interesting and sort of underappreciated right now in terms of um, cyber as an issue and cyber security as an issue with, with very strong allies like Australia or Japan with new partners like India, the, the challenge is that in an escalation scenario for Taiwan or the South China Sea, um, particularly after Ukraine, I would not predict that the Central Military Commission in Beijing says, I have an idea, let's put guys on ships and land in Kaohsiung and invade. They're gonna look for ways to hit the seams um, between you know, kinetic and non-kinetic. And if the fact is we're already at cyber war, particularly Taiwan, it's going on all the time. So, that's going to be the challenge. And our capabilities, even between the US and Australia, are not um, at the same level. Our understanding of escalation control, deterrence, 
compellence counterforce is not aligned, um, and really not with India. <laughs> um, not that India would be in a Taiwan contingency, but but as these partnerships grow, I think we really have to um, focus on cyber as a strategic issue, conceptually in terms of capabilities, and and in all of government, all of society problem. Um, uh, so lots of work for your university, for ASPE, for my center, for CSIS. <laughs> so cyber is the gift that we'll keep on giving. Beck, we'll go to you and then we'll finish uh, with a shock who's travelled the, the furthest. <laughs> uh, we'll do a couple minutes each uh, sure. so that we don't eat into the next panel at all. Sure, sure, sure. Um, look, I don't think I need to say much more than tech transfer. Mike and I know that we are in violent agreement on this one. Um, a lot needs to happen, but we're banging the drum. On the DSR and what that might mean for Australia, India, I mean, I'm, what I'm looking for here is, you know, is, is a balanced and a calibrated approach. We do a lot of really good work already, but we might need to sort of up the ante in some of the traditional ways that we cooperate. But let's have a, a you know, a really good think about where the, the new technologies, the critical and, the, and emerging technologies are taking us and where we have um, some really uh, respective and complementary skills. I think uh, nowhere again you would expect me to say this from my last answer, but I would not focus, um, well, I would not consider it to be a higher priority than, than space and maritime. Um, equal equal um, high priorities, lots of potential. And again, that mix of, you know, traditional platforms and traditional capability with, with how we think about new technologies and not on their own, um, also how we mix these, these newer technologies with existing platforms um, and human capability, right? So human capability and the ability to work together as uh, as forces should be should be front and centre. Um, the risk question is is excellent, and I think the risk industry is going in the same direction as as the conversation in deterrence has been for probably the last decade and a half. Um, it is it needs to be far more integrated. Uh, it is far more complex. It doesn't really fit into a nice matrix anymore. You've got political risk, commercial risk, security risk. Um, so you do need a far more full spectrum or integrated approach to risk. And that's, that's thinking about it differently. That's talking to people who like to put things in buckets um, about taking them out of their buckets and thinking about things more holistically. And Michaela, absolutely brilliant question. Um, State-backed threats, but where is all the innovation and the capability or... 95% of it happening, commercial sector, civil society, universities, not, not necessarily in things that are controlled by the state, certainly not in liberal democratic countries. Um, so my short answer to you, which is not doing enough, um, you know, giving enough merit to your question, is we need to work much more closely together across the seams, um, and it's not just national seams, but it is the seams between government, between industry and civil society itself, within countries and between them. But governments can't solve this, industry won't solve this, and civil society is trying very hard to make a difference and needs to be part of the conversation. It's one of the things that we'll do at Sydney Dialogue. Thank you, Beck. Ashok, before you start, I'm just gonna throw one more question out for <laughs> sure. you, because uh, you're gonna finish us off here. In addition to what we already have from the floor, I would love to know from you, even if it's a one minute answer, what does uh, an, an ideal Australia-India relationship look like in 10 years to you? So you've okay. got a couple to okay. pick from there. I'll, I'll answer three questions. One, the, the, the mechanics of how we can tackle cybersecurity problems. Because of course, this is dynamic. It's kinetic. It will keep changing. But one mechanism India has used, the, the government has used in terms of setting up a digital infrastructure or telecom infrastructure or products in India is a, a list, a list of trusted sources. And within trusted sources, a list of trusted products. And now when it comes to data localization, looking at trusted geographies. Geographies where we'd be willing to store our data and geographies where we would not be willing to store our data. Uh, this is aimed, of course, at primarily the country, which uh, sounds like Canada. But uh, this, this trust as a, as a parameter of cybersecurity, or facing cybersecurity challenges, is going to be very, very important between countries and companies. Uh, talking of risk. Uh, as someone who works in the area of giving corporates, corporations advice on risk, all I can say is people need to be willing to pay for that risk mitigation because risk mitigation is not cheap. We are all suffering from either sourcing concentration or frankly market concentration, which is Australia's big problem. Uh, if you need to, to 
diversify from that, it is going to be expensive. It's going to be expensive for companies and countries. And uh, we need to start getting used to a world which is more expensive, but less risky. And finally, uh, where would I see this relationship in 10 years? In the government- In an ideal world. In an ideal world, uh, it would be, look, I'd give the example of the India-US relationship, which is about 10 or 20, 15 years ahead of the India student relationship. It, it, the modern Indo-US relationship goes back about 25 years. Uh, it's now survived Clinton, uh, Bush, Obama, Trump, Biden. Five very different people and it's grown with each of them. But let me tell you, at each transition, we were worried. Is Bush going to be interested in us? Is Trump going to be interested in, in us? We're still wondering. Uh, okay, and so on and so forth. Okay. With Biden, is he going to be interested in the Pacific? He was, and he, he took it up. Uh, with India and Australia, we have frankly one third of that journey. We've only done about eight or 10 years. And this is the first major transition we're experiencing. So far, it's gone splendidly. But there will be future transitions here and in India. So in, in an ideal world, in 10 years, this relationship would be transition agnostic. Ah. Yeah. Mm. It's still a work in progress. I like that transition agnostic. That is a perfect place to end. And I was told by colleagues I wouldn't get a dinner or a glass of wine if I went <laughs> one minute over. Uh, 45 past and we're at 44 past. So I want my meal and a glass of wine <laughs> soon. I'm very hungry. Thank you so much to our panellists. It was delightful to be able to um, chair this panel. I would like everyone to try to stay where they are. There'll be two minutes before our next panel. So if you need to go to the bathroom, please do, but don't go too far. It's gonna be a very quick transition to our next panel on global cooperation priorities for the G20 and Indo-Pacific leadership. Let's end by giving our panelists a round of applause. Thank you.